Good afternoon, everybody, and you're very welcome to Poetry Ireland's second annual tribute to the singer and song collector Frank Hart. Uh, my name is Catherine Ann Cullen. I'm poet in residence with Poetry Ireland, and I'm delighted we're back with an event to coincide with the Frank Hart Festival, which is run by Ongolene Traditional Singers Club, based across Parnell Square from Poetry Ireland in Club Namuntory. Today's event is called Weaving Words, and we'll be intertwining the threads of poetry, song, and the history of the weaving industry across the island of Ireland, with a nod to our neighboring island as well. We have four wonderful singers for you to enjoy, two cracking speakers and two writers. We have warlike weavers. We're going to find out the root of the phrase half cut. We're going to have serious songs and funny songs. And of course, some lovely new poetry and prose. First up, an especially warm welcome to Terry Moylan. Terry describes himself as an enthusiast of Irish music, song and dance who has published works in all three areas. But he's much more than that. And his most recent uh, book is that he edited um, The Magnificent, A Living Voice, The Frank Hart Song Collection, which not only is the definitive collection of Hart songs, but also includes much of what Hart had to say about his songs. So I'm very much looking forward to Terry uh, speaking now. Thank you, Catherine and thanks for inviting me to be part of this. Dublin has been blessed in her abundance of song makers and singers, and two of them in particular have made a great impression on me, Michael Morden, known as Zosimus, and Frank Hart. Although he died in the middle of the 19th century, I had heard of Zosimus before I had heard of Frank. As a lover of ballads from my pre-teens, by the time I was 17 or so, I had read the stories about this extraordinary character in such places as W.B. Yeats' essay, The Last Glee Man, P.J. McCall's In the Shadow of St. Patrick's, and the memoir of the great original Zosimus, published a couple of decades after his death, which took place in April 1846. Zosimus's songs included the biblical fantasy, The Finding of Moses, which places some of the events of that story in the environs of Dublin, introducing such place names as Donnybrook, the Phoenix Park and the Poddle. Billy's downfall, recording the attempt to destroy the equestrian statue of William of Orange, which once stood in College Green, and The Men of Sweet Liberties, to be sung shortly by Jerry O'Reilly, which celebrates the inhabitants and the industry of the liberty of the Earl of Meath in Dublin's south inner city. My introduction to Frank himself was a kind of road to Damascus moment. Browsing one day in the 1960s in the record racks of Pickett's music shop at the bottom of Grafton Street, I came upon the sleeve of Frank's first LP, Dublin Street Songs. The cover consisted simply of a black and white photograph of the dilapidated open door of a once grand Georgian mansion. The meanings embedded in the title and the picture had more effects on me than I can readily articulate. I had not heard actual traditional singers up to this time, so I had been accustomed to my favourite musical fare being served up in a more or less professional cabaret style by groups accompanying themselves on instruments. Frank's album seemed to me to represent something incomprehensibly more real and was the first avenue I found open to me to get behind cabaret presentations. Zosimus wrote and Frank sang, sang songs of ordinary life in Dublin, songs about people that could have been my neighbours or even relations. My father was a cabinet maker by trade and, my, and his mother had a furniture shop on Dean Street at the edge of the Liberty. That's looking up Dean Street up into the Coombe and my grandmother's house, the biggest one on the street on the right hand side. I was born and reared in St Albans Road right beside the Tenters and first went to school in Weaver Square. So from an early age, I was exposed to the folklore of the weaving industry 
that made the district famous and which was documented for hundreds of years, not least in the songs of Frank and of Zosimus. As the place name Weaver Square suggests, the district was known as the center of the weaving trade and it is commonly thought of as the center of the Liberties. It was in the Northern city center part of the Liberties that the weaving trade became established and flourished for several generations, several centuries. It's not easy nowadays to understand the place that the weavers occupied in the life and history of Dublin. They were highly skilled craftsmen who manufactured the most beautiful fabrics but they also had the reputation of being staunch defenders of their rights and privileges and were ready to resort to ferocious measures if these were threatened. A good comparison would be with the radical artisans who lived in the Faubourg Saint Antoine district east of the Bastille in Paris, whose armed eruptions into the city were such a notable feature of the French Revolution. The weavers' warlike inclinations are well recorded. Their arch enemies were the butchers who were based around Ormond Quay and Ormond Square on the north of the Liffey. And the two groups regularly fought each other in full-scale battles, sometimes lasting for several days, with the front ebbing and flowing across the river bridges according as one side or the other gained the advantage. Prisoners taken by either side in these affairs were treated with savage brutality. Some idea of how formidable a presence the weaving community constituted in Dublin life may be learned from the numbers involved. At a high point in the 1770s, there were 3,000 looms operating in the city and the industry employed some 19,000 people. In 1791, just counting silk weaving alone, there were 1,200 looms in operation. I'll finish with a few remarks on the history of the weaving trade in Dublin. It is not true, but has often been asserted that weaving and silk weaving in particular was established by Huguenot tradesmen fleeing persecution in France after Louis XIV's revocation of the Edict of Nantes. This is not the case. A small number of Huguenot weavers did arrive in Dublin, but they entered a trade that was already long established. The Corporation of Weavers of the Guild of the Blessed Virgin Mary was established in Dublin as early as 1446. Wool and silk weaving had become a huge industry by the 17th century. Restrictions imposed on wool exports by the British government led to the development of Irish poplin, which, as it was not pure wool, it was a mixture of silk and wool, escaped the commercial sanctions. A rhyme of the time of the volunteers went, was she not a fool when she took off our wool to leave us so much of the leather, the leather? It ne'er entered her pate that a sheepskin well bait would draw a whole nation together, together. The leather was of course the drumheads of the corps of volunteers who had forced limited parliamentary independence from Britain and the proletarian heft behind their movement was, of course, the skilled weavers of their liberties. Thanks. That was absolutely fantastic, Terry. Thank you. <laughs> that was lovely and really beautifully woven together the idea of Zosimus, Frank Hart and uh, the weavers of Dublin. Um, thank you. So like uh, Terry, our next guest has strong liberties connections. Uh, Jerry O'Reilly is another proud native of that part of Dublin and one of the founders of the Golian Traditional Singing Club, which celebrated its 40th anniversary uh, in 2019. And uh, Jerry has two wonderful solo albums, Down From Your Pulpits, Down From Your Thrones and Havoc in Heaven. They're both full of wonderful songs and wonderful singing. And Jerry's also helped produce uh, some CDs by other people of singing in Irish and in English. So Jerry, I think you're gonna sing for us uh, uh, ye men of sweet liberties, and maybe you might have a few words to say first. Thank you, Catherine. Yes, um, I'm going to sing ye men of sweet liberties. Um, this first appeared in uh, the book that Terry mentioned, which was um, published uh, a couple of a couple of decades after uh, Zosimus died, uh, the memoir of Zosimus. And uh, whether Zosimus actually wrote it or not is open to question. 
but it's certainly the sentiments expressed in it are very very strong and then um, I remember uh, growing up in my childhood I was, for the first eight years of my life I lived in number five Harty Place off Clambrasil Street and I went to school in Warrenmount Convent first and then went on to Francis Street. So in actual fact, um, the, the, the photograph that Terry showed there, I walked by that shop every, every day on my way to school going to Francis Street CBS. <clears throat> so here's Ye Men of Sweet Liberties and Frank Hart was, a, was my source for this, of course. <clears throat> oh, ye men, the sweet liberties all. And ye women all round the coam, and ye weavers we must call to sustain every shuttle and loom. Bring your silks and your satins and tweeds, and your tabinets all in their priam. Bring them forth perfect with speed, as ye did in our Parliament's time. Let us sing of the coom and each street, long before the vile union was known, when the lords and the nobles did meet, and around us a glory had thrown. Then high were new market and court, the puddle, the chamber, the manor, where every one they did resort, placing trade on the liberty's banner. Sing Brown Street and Sweet Warden Mount, Vandal Alley and then me old Black Pits, which hear from me my first account, and where I have made all me best hits. There's Cork Street and Mill Street and John Street, with all of their alleys and layans, and Marabone Lane ever sweet. Where strong water got ever more rains. Sing the streets of our dee, Mead and Dean, Thomas, Francis and dear Ash of old, With their chapels and schools that retain, Oh, a spirit unbroken and bold. Then it's up with the fringes once more, And that Erin have justice and joyous, Free trade and home rule restore, and the rights of the liberty buyers. All oh, ye men, the sweet liberties all. Beautiful, Jerry. And I think that is definitely the definitive the definitive version of that song for me. I love the way the song goes through all those streets of Dublin. It's just so evocative. And uh, obviously streets that you and Terry know very well. Um, I, uh, staying in the weaving area of Dublin, when I met my husband nearly 20 years ago, he was living off Cork Street, uh, just beyond Weaver Square. And uh, so I wrote this poem uh, partly for today's event and to commemorate that important event in our lives. Um, and it's called Love in the Tenters. Over the tenters, the clouds are flocks of sheep whose wool escapes in wisps, drifts down the air. Were I a weaver, love, I'd bag the stuff and spin a coat of sky for you to wear. This is where my mouth and yours first met, winding our slow thread home beyond the coombe. Our steps crisscrossing over Weaver's Square, where by their ghostly looms, ghost weavers loom. Here, like poor weavers in the winter storm, we'll tenter our cloths before the alehouse fire. What you don't stretch might shrink, so hook your dreams and pull them tight and wide as your desire. We've searched the eyes of ghosts and not yet ghosts, learned to weave poplin lives like all our ilk. Across the warp of wool or worsted yarn, look for the wealth, sorry, look for the weft of silk. And that's love in the tenters. Um, so next up is um, Morris Layden, who is a traditional singer and a, a song collector who's originally from Cookstown in Tyrone and lives in Belfast. He's the author of 
Belfast City of Song and a book that's very close to my heart, Boys and Girls Come Out to Play, which is a collection of Irish uh, singing games. And he has a forthcoming book on the social history of the linen industry in Belfast, which is called The Linen Weavers. A few years ago, I heard Morris give a talk on children's songs from the mills in Belfast. And one song about rival May Queens became a, weir, a real earworm. You have been warned. Morris. Thank you. So the first line of a handloom weaver song will always refer to the trade. I am a wee weaver confined to my loom. Song called the Wee Weaver from Tony. It's three long quarters I have been weaving. That's a song called Long Cookstown, which is uh, I'm very fond of that because I'm from Cookstown. Come all you loyal weavers that ramble up and down. A song called The Jolly Weaver. It being on the 23rd of June, as I sat weaving all on me loom. The Jug of Punch. I am a bow weaver. I've a done my end a deaver. The County Tyrone. And finally, I am a brisk weaver and very well known. Song called The Nabin of Stains. Now, weavers were adept at using linen idioms in their speech. And I'm going to do a few of these for you. I would, I were a weaver, I could sing all manner of songs written by Shakespeare, that quote. It will brush off like a weaver's kiss, which basically means that something is very unimportant. Never wash your dirty linen in public. The going foot is always getting something done. And this is a reference to the spinner uh, and uh, her leg all the time, her foot uh, pressing the treadle. So the spinner was always busy. Never judge a woman or linen by candlelight. Very, very old expression used a lot, uh, particularly in dark linen halls where we couldn't see the quality of fabric and they would go outside to have a look at it. Swifter than a weaver's shuttle my days have been. That's my favourite quote. Now, when a weaver had woven 40 yards or a cut, he was paid for his work. But too often he went to the pub and got cut with his money. Sometimes the linen merchant paid out a sum when a half cut was woven. Hence the expression, he's half cut, meaning that someone is half drunk or just bluttered. So it's a, a linen uh, expression that was used a lot to be half cut. It's an expression that's still used. It was said that the characteristic, characteristics of a good hand loom weaver for the more substantial linen fabrics were a hawk's eye, a bear's foot, and a lady's hand. So here's a few verses uh, of a song called The Weaver's when I was a weaver, I carried my bodkin and shears. When I was a weaver, I carried my reed and my gears. My temples also, my small clothes and cane in my hand. And wherever I go, here's a jolly bold weaver again. My name is Frank Devlin. I live nigh to Donnamore. I won't amass under mullen, diapers and sweet money more. I wove lawns in Killyburn, Cambrick's and Long Cook's Town. The best music to my ears was the shuttle sweet sound. On the 18th of May in 1762, 
Those cursed drippers, they punished us with their laws anew. In Lisburn with blackthorn stakes, we forced them all to flee. And we swore all our webs ne'er inspected should be. But I'll be a good weaver and happy to jog along. I'll ply my own trade as I sing my weaving songs. When my time it is o'er, contented with life I'll be. I'll weave the warp and the weft of life's rich tapestry. three. So that's the weaver's web. Uh, now, Catherine, I know uh, going back a couple of years ago, the, the traditional song project in Belfast, uh, you were there and uh, you liked the children's songs. Uh, a lot, uh, and the fact that you've remembered them, I'm very happy about that. Uh, so I'm going to sing some children's song from the young millies, or the mill workers, and they're celebrating the Queen of the May festivities and indeed the arrival of summer. So uh, here we go with uh, To Be the Queen of the May. Our queen's up the river with her, ya, ya, ya. Our queen's up the river with her, ya, ya, ya. Our queen's up the river and we'll keep her there forever with her, ya, 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 ya. The other queen down the river with her, boo, boo, boo. The other queen down the river with her, boo, boo, boo. The other queen down the river and we'll keep her there forever with her, boo. Boo, 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 boo. Our queen can burn her leg, burn her leg, burn her leg. Our queen can burn her leg, burn her leg. Our queen can tumble up pole, tumble up pole, tumble up pole. Our queen can tumble up pole, tumble up pole. Our queen is six foot high, six foot high, six foot high. Our queen is six foot high, six foot high. Our queen can smoke a fig, smoke a fig, smoke a fig. Our queen can smoke a fig, smoke a fig. Our queen can eat a hard bop, eat a hard bop. Eat a hard bop, our queen can eat a hard bop, eat a hard bop. Our queen can eat a loaf, eat a corn loaf, eat a corn loaf. Our queen can eat a corn loaf, eat a corn loaf. Our queen up the river with her, ya, ya, ya. Our queen up the river with her, ya, ya, ya. Our queen up the river and we'll keep her there forever with her ya, 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 ya. The other queen down the river with her boo, boo, boo. boo. The other queen down the river with her boo, boo, boo. The other queen down the river and we'll keep her there forever with her boo, 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 boo. Boo, boo, boo. Thanks so much to Morris and especially for indulging my enjoyment of his last song. Next, we have Heather Richardson, who is a Belfast writer and senior lecturer in creative writing at the Open University. Her poetry and short stories and creative nonfiction have been widely published, and she's published two novels, um, Magdeburg and D Doubting Thomas. Um, her textile art has been exhibited as part of the Linen Biennale in Lisburn and at the F.E. McWilliam Gallery in Banbridge. I particularly loved the idea of Heather's project in memory of her aunt Kathleen, who worked in a linen mill in South Derry and died tragically young. But I think Heather has commemorated her in a, in a beautiful and optimistic way. Heather. Thanks, Catherine. Um, yes. Um... 
my project address for Kathleen really started as a kind of strange coming together of my my writing, which is kind of the day job, um, and my lifelong interest in, in textiles and in embroidery and all those kinds of things. And for some weird reason, I'd never really made the connection between the um, you know, the kind of family connection um with the, the linen industry um and with um and, and with my own um kind of interest in that area. Um so my aunt Kathleen um which it seems strange to call her um, an aunt because um, um, she she died um, long, long before I was born. Um, and I'm just going to try and share a little slideshow here. Maybe um, maybe somebody can can make a noise when you can see what I'm trying to show. Um, can that be? Um, can you see that, Catherine? And all. So my aunt Kathleen um, was born in 1925 in a little village called Kilray um, or a town called Kilray in County Derry. And when she was 14 years old, she left school and went to work at William Clark and Sons Linen Mill in Upperlands, which is a, is a, a small village that really grew up around the mill. Um, and very tragically, she was, was killed in a cycling accident, um, cycling home from work um, in December of 1939, just after the Second World War had started. Um, now, Kathleen didn't actually work in the, the manufacturing um, side of things. Um, so um, I'll just stop that. Um, she actually um, was working as a trainee typist um, so had, had left school and had gone into the into the office there um, and it was a story kind of one of those family stories we're not a family that actually kind of shares stories and anecdotes it's just you know stuff happens and nobody talks about it and find kind of northern tradition of um, deep repression um, so I didn't really know too much about her and as I found out more about her and found out that she worked in in, in the linen industry in the kind of broader sense I, I I wanted to do something to memorialize her but I didn't want to write it down as a story um, because it just didn't seem fitting so what I decided to do in the end was to make a dress um, that was in sort of a bit of an attempt at magical thinking it was imagining what if what if that terrible accident hadn't happened what if she'd lived to celebrate her 21st birthday and had maybe had a dress made um, you know to go to dances and so on um, so I used a, an authentic pattern from, from the period I used linen that was actually made in William Clark and Sons in Upperlands um, and I, I made this dress for her and I embroidered it with um, my kind of reimagined idea of what some of her thoughts might have been as she went through um, through her life. Um, I've, uh, you saw in the slides there hopefully just some an idea of, of the way that that was kind of hand embroidered on there and um, I thought I could read out a couple of the, the sort of little fragments of her thinking um, that are, um, are embroidered onto the dress if that's, if that's okay. Okay. Um, um, it's it's fascinating, you know, as, as you as you will all know from your interest in the in the weaving area, you know, just the language of it is so so beautiful and evocative. And um, I really wanted to kind of capture the sense of a young woman, you know, just on the on the kind of on the verge of of adulthood with that kind of wonderful kind of curiosity and sort of sponge like way of absorbing all this exciting new information that she was getting from her job um, in the linen, the linen trade. So I've just a couple of little fragments here. Um, first one is uh, is called Futures. And Miss Kidd, just for information, was the teacher at the uh, at the National School where Catherine went. Miss Kidd advised Colerain Tech for shorthand and typing. Kate Turner was going too. We looked up the bus times. Kate said she would apply for the civil service when she was older. Find digs in Belfast. Go to dances. Daddy said he'd spoke to someone at Clark's Mill in Upperlands. They were looking a girl for the office. I could learn my typing as I worked. Bertie was already apprenticed there. The Clarks were ahead of their times. They had electricity in their houses. Bertie had been sent once to fit a light bulb in the dining room at Ard Tara. Their children boated on the lake in the summertime while the looms rattled and the beetling mill thundered. Mammy said I should keep on with my learning a while more, but Daddy wouldn't listen. I told her I didn't mind. I liked the notion of working. Once a week, Daddy brings home a newspaper. Bertie and I read it when he's finished. There's a lot of talk about the war. Mammy and I made blackout blinds for the windows. 
sometimes I sit out by above the train track and think about all the places there are to go. And then the second little fragment that I'll finish with is called The Language of Linen. When I was at school, I knew about flax flowers and pulling lint when it was ready and the retting dams and bleach greens. I knew each tiny flower would open in the morning and be withered by noon. Cycling from home to upperlands these summer mornings, I can see the blue hint of blossom in the flax fields. The firm itself is told in colours. The brown room, the black dye house, the green race. The price lists are books of poetry. They teach me the language of linen. Holland in black, brown, pale and fancy colours. Military buckram, Russian crash, sleeve scrim, collar canvas, union doulas, huckaback, unfinished. The great ledgers on the high desks of the office are biggest church Bibles. Orders recorded in careful copper plate. I write names I've only seen in advertisements. Anderson and Macaulay, the athletic stores, Arnott and Co in Dublin, and others more exotic. Auguste Dormel in London. Orders for damask napery and fine dress linen. And lately, Black ARP cloth, 500 yards to Palace Barracks, 700 yards to the new Savoy Hotel, 900 yards to St. Patrick's Barracks, Ballymena. At once, at once, at once. And there was a line that Morris quoted there, um, one of his phrases about uh, faster than a speeding shuttle has been my life. And I think for, for poor Kathleen, although she wasn't actually working with, with shuttles, her, her life did, did speed by um, very swiftly. Um, but I hope in, um, in the, the piece of art that I've produced for her, that it's, um, it's you know, uh, captures something of, of the kind of um, the life that she had and she might have had if she'd, uh, if she'd managed to live a bit longer. So thank you. Thank you. That's absolutely gorgeous, Heather. I love that project. I love the idea of something so tangible as well to remember, just not just words, but also the dress. I think that's really, yeah. really lovely. Thank you here. so much. So, it's very, lovely. A very portable piece of art. <laughs> yeah, it's very nice. Um, so my next guest is no stranger to anyone who loves traditional singing. And he's certainly no stranger to me because he is my uncle, Jerry Cullen. Um, Jerry's from Drogheda. He's a song collector and a singer, and he is best known as um, the bass singer of the traditional singing trio, The Voice Squad, uh, which has been going for more years than I'm sure any of them care to remember. He also uh, creates the harmony structure for each of their songs. Um, Jerry's going to give us um, a song from a radical weaver and songwriter from, from Drogheda, and I, I'm going to let Jerry uh, tell, me, tell us about that himself. Thanks, Maria. Thank you very much, Anne. Um, uh, the writer that you refer to is uh, John Shields, uh, often confused with the Richard Shield who was hanging around at the same time. And it's really only recently that John came into his own, that uh, before the, say, the last 30, 40 years, uh, very few people had heard of him at all. And it, is, it turned out he was born in 1784 in the north of Ireland was probably brought to, brought to Drogheda when he was very young, just as a visitor, and then went back to his own place, which left meant that he was 14 or thereabouts during the 98 rebellion, of which is, people say he, he took part, that he, he was over in the West when the French landed and so on, but maybe that's true. But it's not known when he came into Drogheda, but uh, it's it believed sometime in the 1800s anyway. And he was a weaver, a weaver by trade, uh, but when he did start uh, doing his writing, he had all, all this the, sort of from the from the bardic tradition. He had all the internal rhyming and various things that he put to his to his English songs. At the time in Drogheda, an awful lot of Irish was spoken, uh, as can be evidenced from uh, Bernard Tumulty's uh, manuscript in the in the Royal Academy, uh, where, where there are he had listed three hundred songs, a hundred in Irish and two hundred in English, just the titles. He had intended getting a book out. This is Bernard Tomlinson. But um, 
Shield then w- was so successful at his songwriting. He, uh, he he wrote a lot of political songs, great songs like "The Rights of Man," uh, obviously referencing Thomas Paine, and uh, great humorous songs uh, like uh, maybe "The Cuckoo's Nest" or "The uh, Wedding of Sweet Valtre" or "Garristown Jack" or some of those. An awful lot of humor in those, and uh, as well as that, he, he mostly took up a lot of time writing love songs. So I had a list of at least 100, 120 titles for love songs, uh, like um, the, Phoenix, the, the Phoenix of Fingal, or uh, The Dazzling Comet of Cullen Town, or The Lovely Sweet Queens Were Alas, or there's a nice one here, Anne, called Greenmount, Greenmount Smiling Anne. I mentioned that my mother worked in Greenmount and Boyne uh, in the mills there in the 1920s, the late 20s, and my brother worked there much later in the 60s. But um, Shields give up the, the, the Shields give up the, the, the weaving eventually because the, the songs were doing so well. And even in his obituary, it mentioned that uh, his songs had traveled far away to America and were sung by various people over there. And even a Christy minstrel group had sung his songs in the Rotunda in Dublin. So that was a real high point, obviously. But uh, poor Shields lived until he was 88 and died in 1872 and is buried in the Cord Cemetery in Drada. He wrote his own obituary, or his own uh, uh, epitaph, but um, people forgot to put a stone up from until recently. But in the last 10 years or so, we, we got a stone up to, to John Shields. So I've gone on a little bit, and too much. This song is not, he, unfortunately, he didn't write too many songs about weaving. So this one here is about a tailor who, who uh, falls in love with a girl, gives him his, gives, makes the mistake of giving her his money to mind, but she skedaddles with a a no good fellow who had no teeth. So be careful. Okay. This is called um, the nice little, neat little factory made. And just a thing that, that, that Terry mentioned earlier, it was mentioned at the, towards the end of the 1700s, early 1800s, that there were several thousand looms in Drogheda in the cabins. The cabins were a disgrace. They were filthy and there were clay covered floors. Uh, there were surveys done. They earned a pittance. And so they wove linen and they wove cotton there. And uh, the numbers were, it was the ma- one of the major sources of employment in the town at the time. And there were huge outcries again about the, uh, the living, the living uh, uh, conditions that these people worked in. Okay. <clears throat> you who love sporting and maids to be courting, it's you that I wish to give ear to my tale. And pity my folly for joking with Dolly that gave me the slip with a ragman set sail. In Mel I first knew her, and there to be sure, she looked like an angel, though plainly arrayed. I hard did endeavor to get in her favor, the nice little, neat little factory maid. Although being a tailor, I thought I could nail her. I made her my purse bearer, that is the fact. Six pounds in hard kelpers, I thought that might melt her. From love's killing crucible, not to retract. But poor simple Terry, how can I be merry? Or ever again trust a dandified jade? How can I be jolly when I think on Dolly, the nice little neat little factory maid? One evening I met her, I cannot forget her, close by to green hills on the banks of the Boyne. For sweet recreation, like wise conversation, we both walked together, I think, until nine. It made me a martyr, to think for to part her, I ne'er thought this villain she could me betray. I ne'er did suspect her, and still did respect her, the nice little neat little factory maid. We walked up the keys, and each one made their way then, she to the rope walk, and I to West Gate. Going up Stockwell Lane, I met Paddy McLean, a nosy old ragman, I'd say fifty-eight. He asked me quite slyly if I'd seen Dol Riley, 
He was the matter, but too long delayed. He said he would meet her and surely would treat her, the nice little, neat little factory maid. My head it did ache, not a word could I speak. I would have fell down, but hung on to the wall. When I looked at this creature, the dregs then of nature, like a half-murdered calf, I began to bawl. I looked at this old boy who just had the one eye, no nose and no teeth, and in sorrow I said, Is this Dolly's laddie as old as her daddy, the nice little, neat little factory maid? I was hurt to the quick, and my heart, it fell sick, my legs, they were bent, and I vow and declare. My body was shivering, my heart, it was a quivering. I called on grim death to finish me there. The ragman, he left me, of comfort bereft me. To think by a villain that I'd been betrayed. That stole my hard earnings and left me in mourning. The nice little, neat little factory maid. My goose and my scissors, to use them I'll never. My lapboard and bobkin, I vow to give o'er. And likewise my symbol, although I was nimble, I care not a whit for now. My time's o'er. Let every young tailor mind poor Terry Naylor, and ne'er trust the women, or you'll be betrayed. And beware of the fillies, I mean the dandelies, the hateful, deceitful, vile factory maid. That was lovely, Jerry. <laughs> I can't yeah, rattle on a little bit. <laughs> that was gorgeous. Um, dear, the poor old factory maid didn't get out too well out of that one. <laughs> well, she got off with a few bob. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was Jerry Cullen. Uh, thank you so much, Jerry. That was just gorgeous. Um, Jerry mentioned his mother, um, Kitty Cullen, who worked in the Green Mount Mills in Drogheda, Green Mount and Boyne. And that was my grandmother. And um, I've written her a poem. Uh, she used to refer to the factory as the stitching. I never really heard her talk about it. I don't think she did talk about it much, but just heard that she'd worked in the stitching. So this is just called the stitching and it's for Kitty. You were buttonholed early for a factory girl. The pattern of your life laid out before you'd clocked up a dozen years. The school bell still called to others, but you tuned your ear to the factory whistle, threaded your way from the cord road to the mill through the long eye of the railway arch. You dreamed of taking the train, but your journey was a small track of stitches sewing yourself out of childhood. Whatever song was in your head, the mill drowned out. Your foot learned to keep time on the treadle. You bent your head to the breakneck metronome. No wonder your clatter of children never rattled you after the mill's racket, the rat-a-tat of a thousand machines, door knockers no one answered. At 19, you left the stitching for a production line of babies. You never spoke of the factory, took no credit for your skill. And when we hesitated over homework, you shook your head. I only met the scholars coming home. I only got to first book, you said. So that's it. Um, that was my um, poem for Kitty. And um, sorry. Um, my last guest today, I'm very happy to um, introduce um, Brenda Nirirdon. Um Brenda's going to sing as well, second last guest, sorry. <laughs> my second last guest today is Brenda Nirirdon. Um The author of the Brenda at Ling and you can Aaron Asquelga a canoe doing. Um, this is a comic song um, about uh, a man who's a fuller in the weaving trade. When he goes out in his boat, he catches the eye of quite a few women, but he's hooked literally by Molly and her mother who follow along after. 
Uh, Brenda, I know you won first place at the Oireachtas uh, 2013 with this song in the Aronioch Noc Shannos E, or the Non Shannos section. So, Brenda, if you can unmute yourself, we'll look forward to hearing your song. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to sing Aurani and Shidamin. I would have heard this song at home. Um, my late mom, like myself, uh, was a harpist and a singer, and her harpist friends at Christmas, if, if possible, on Nulligan Wan would come to the house and they would sing these songs. Um, in 2010, I had the delight to join Corban Kule. Uh, under, under the direction of Padre Rueda. And this song was part of the repertoire. So I'd like to sing Aurani Shizami. Ukramarshan kush bounden is long ago. Our own in children mean she sorum so. Gackle is kaipery is grime a coolery. Our own in children mean she sorum so. Martin came all on me, trollerum trollerum. Bali a vodak, Heart like a scunter, parus and praisily. Our own in children mean she soon room so. The shanvans the tint on is born of the pipecky. Our own in children mean she soon room so. The bucker on nulla in a hook on Marishaki. Our own in children mean she soon so. Martin came all on me, trollerum, trollerum. Bali a voodock, len yarquiha, yarquiha. Part like a scunter, parsum praisily. Our own in children mean she soon so. Go, Balia can toll ya. Whom Martin a keeper up, our own in children mean she soon so. Ballig bans fair, er mirror in a heap alone, our own in children mean she soon so. Martin came all on me, trollerum, trollerum, Bally a voodock, lanyard quee, hanyard quee ha, heart like a scunter. How some praise the our own in children mean she so rum so land Molly saw body some more her a tune looking our own in children mean she so rum so a garret in a year for a marching a crook a our own in children mean she so rum so. Martin came all on me, trollerum, trollerum. Bali a voodock, linyard quiha, nyard quiha. Part like a scunter, parasum praisily. Our own in children mean she so rum so. Oh. Ukram or shang kush bound and is kuram air. Our own in children mean she so rum so. Bert fans a tint on is cleave on secludega. Our own in children mean she so rum so. Martin came all on me, trollerum, trollerum. Bali a voodock. Lanyard quiha, nyard quiha, heart like a scunter, parsum praisily. Our own in children mean she soon so. 
آران این چیز رو می شسورم سلام آران این چیز رو می شسورم سلام Gahal and Erfad, <laughs> Gahal and Erfad, Brenda, that was just absolutely beautiful. Thank you. When I asked uh, our friend Anthony O'Farrakhan, and uh, did he know any weaving songs in Irish, he says, I have the woman for you. And that was Brenda Nirirdham. So, so thanks to Anthony for the tip and thank you to Brenda for the lovely song. Um, thanks to everybody who took part today. We're going to into our last song shortly. So I just want to say thank you so much uh, for all the erudite information and all the beautiful songs and lovely creative writing. Uh, to Terry Moylan, Jerry O'Reilly, uh, Heather Richardson, Jerry Cullen, uh, Morris Layton, uh, Brendan E. Reardon. I can't really thank myself, I suppose. And uh, coming up next, we have the only person who actually has worked in a mill who is in our uh, show today. And that's Rosie Davis. Rosie is a singer and a dancer, originally from Liverpool. And she's this year's Ongolian singer at the Frank Hart Festival. Um, you'll find links to the Frank Hart Festival on frankhartfestival.ie. Um, Rosie studied woven textiles at Liverpool uh, at the art school there in the 1960s. And she worked in several Lancashire mills. Um, so as I said, she's the only actual mill worker with mm -hmm. us today. And here to introduce her lovely song and finish our event today day uh, is Rosie Davis. Hello Catherine, thank you for asking me to do this. Um, I'm going to sing um, a song by Ewan McVicker, so it's really uh, Scottish uh, Scottish weavers, but uh, I did spend a bit, a bit of time um, in some, uh, it was actually carpet mills in, in Lancashire, which was great because it gave me a chance to um, further my interest in clog dancing and just I, I have a little tiny pair of clogs here to show you which were my daughter's clogs but when I say Lancashire clogs people think of wooden clogs but if I hold it up you can see there's a wooden sole and a leather upper and then underneath this has got rubber but actually they probably had irons on in, in, in the mills and, 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 and people wore them in the mill I actually bought my clogs um, off a market stall in Nelson when I was learning to dance. So they were, you know, used a lot then. But this song is really about um, uh, the mill girl really in the mill and just not having a sweetheart. Um, I like it a lot because it reminds me of my auntie, my auntie Letitia, my auntie Letty, who was um, an engineer in, the, in a knitting mill in the village that I worked in. Nearly everybody worked in this and Bear Brand there and she'd lost her sweetheart in the first world war and so remained um, a spinster although she was a knitter if you see what I mean and uh, it's, um, it's a song about the, the women who spun the yarn and it's called shift and spin <clears throat> shift and spin warp and twine making threads coarse and fine Dreaming of my valentine, working in the mill. Keep your bobbins running easy, always show your bright and breezy. Wait until Prince Charming sees you, working in the mill. Oil your runners, mend your threads. Do your best until you're dead. Wish you were a wife instead of working in the mill. Shift and spin, warp and twine, making threads coarse and fine. Dreaming of your valentine, working in the mill. Used to be, th used to think I'd be the rage, smiling on some fashion page. Never thought I'd be a wage slave, working in the mill. I used to think that love, life was kind. No, it isn't. Never mind. 
Maybe one day love will find you working in the mill. Shift and spin, warp and twine, making threads coarse and fine. Dreaming of my valentine, working in the mill. He loves you not, so what? Do the best with what you've gotten. Earn your money and spin your cotton, working in the mill. Shift and spin, warp and twine. Making threads coarse and fine, dreaming of my Valentine working in the mill. Thank you.